Thank you, Taylor. And thank you to everybody coming to our coaches clinic here at Huddle Swish. Uh, really appreciate everyone's time and uh, coming together. So today we're going to be talking about ball screen defense and the way we use it in our program here at Ferguson High School and some of the things that have been successful for us. Uh, we're going to go through some of the basic coverages that we go through. Uh, we're going to have here some of them. We're going to have drop over. We're going to have drop under some adjustments. Then we're going to talk about our open up versus our dribble handoff and then the trap. And the way we like to discuss and call our stuff is everybody that's involved is going to have a call. So drop is the guy guarding the screener over under would be what the guy guarding the ball handler would do. Uh, then the open up versus drop uh, dribble handoff is how we're going to guard the dribble handoff in specific. And then I'm going to go into some significant detail about how we're going to guard the trap. Some great keys that you guys need to have when it comes to ball screen defense is going to be, be aggressive on the ball. Don't let the, the offense dictate where the ball is going to be communicate and lastly, no paint touches. If you can eliminate paint touches off dribble handoffs, I mean, off of ball screens, you're going to be specifically good. First thing we're going to talk about is our drop and drop over in specific. Drop over was something that we used significantly all year. This game is actually against our uh, district rival in the district semifinal at home. Um, we were going to use drop over. That was part of the game plan coming in. This is really early in the game. This is second, third possession. And we call drop over, but now some of the keys we talked about, be aggressive on the ball. We don't do that on this possession. So I want to show you guys what it looks like when it's done poorly. And then we're going to talk about the stuff when it's done right and how you can defend so much better when you do all the little things right. So first thing, we allow the ball handler to get into an area where he's comfortable. He's dictating where the screen's going to happen. He's dictating everything. We don't like to do that. We want to put pressure on this ball. We want to communicate early and often. We're very big on not caring if the offense knows what we're doing. If you know that we're going to go, go over, that's fine. You have to be able to execute against it. Um, so we're really big on communicating early. And in this, you're going to see our center is screaming, right, 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 which is what we call. But he, our, our, he's a freshman, wasn't all the way up on the ball. And that's expected. You know, you're going to make some mistakes. But early in the possession, not great to give that much space. So this is what happens. You get screened. He knows he has to go over. So now what is he doing? Our drop coverage is sagging off, giving plenty of space so that he doesn't get pinned by any sort of roll. He's keeping his chest in front of the ball. And our guard's responsibility is to fight over this and to take away the space of the ball handler. We're doing way too much space here. And when this happens, and in specific against this team, they're going to look to take mid-range pull-ups at the elbow. That is their bread and butter. They absolutely love it. So ball handler with a fairly routine off the ball screen, going to his left, easy pull up, automatic two there. That, that, that's automatic. Now, here's another situation. This is the very next possession. Same player, same player. This time they ran it on this side of the floor. Again, we're not putting any ball pressure, right? So now the ball handler has all control of what's going to happen. And as a defense... And something that we love to do is we like to eliminate the, the offense, all their options, and give them one or two. Because if we can only limit you to one or two op options, it's going to be a lot easier for us to be able to defend it. Now, on this possession, you're going to see screens coming to the inside, again, communicating, and he is shifting his body. You can see the guy guarding the screen or our center is shifting his body to make sure he keeps his chest on the other side of the screen, but between the ball handler and the rim. Because at the end of the day, we don't want paint touches. So here comes the screen. Once again, we don't do a particularly good job, again, getting over because we didn't take away space. Our big, keeping his chest in front of the ball, okay? Now what happens on the weak side is we have what we call gap defense. We're, we're big on pack line. Um, and so this, defend, this defender has to stink in because he sees this guy penetrating and he doesn't want to give up an easy paint touch. We're big on no paint at Ferguson. But when that happens, now you've got backdoor cutters open, shooters open on the weak side because of a lack of execution on ball side, right? And then we end up getting a turnover here, but could have been an easy layup. Once again, now this is a different person guarding another player. This was actually their best ball handler last season. And again, they get into a side ball screen. We are not putting any pressure on the ball. We're making it very easy. Offensive player can set this screen at the three-point line, has plenty of space when he comes off of it as we try to go over to get to their favorite spot, elbow jumper, and it's automatic every single time. So after a couple of possessions of seeing it the wrong way, we get on the team and we talk about picking up pressure, right? So now look, look at the difference here. Same first quarter, 
not not much later, we pick up the ball now all the way at the volleyball line. Now we are not letting the offensive player dictate where the screen happens. That's one. Two, when he comes off, if he wants to take that one dribble pull up, that's a really deep three. You're looking at NBA range, college range three, and that's really low percentage at the high school level. So by pushing up and playing pressure on the ball, making the screen occur higher up the floor, it makes it easier for us to be able to defend on the other side. So again, we see that we pick up pressure. And now as he goes to go over the screen, notice what the defender does. He's going to get really tight. He took away all the ball handler space and he fought his way over this screen where the screen became almost ineffective. Fights over the top, keeps them in front, doesn't give them anything easy. And from there, we get into another side ball screen. So now this same exact player, and this is something that happens at the high school level. So if you're a high school coach, you know, the hardest thing to get guys to do is to be consistent on every possession. It's very difficult, especially when you're asking to do something that's hard, which is aggressive on ball defense. So this kid uh, is our starting point guard, picks the ball up, does a really nice job on the first time, getting over the top, being aggressive on the, on the ball screen. Second time it happens, he sits and waits, doesn't take away space. And what happens? Open shot for their best player. That's their best score. Did it go in? No. But our biggest thing is if somebody gets a wide open shot because we did something wrong or we made a mistake, we count them as makes. In film the next day, that's a made shot. That's three points that they should have that we just got lucky because getting lucky defensively is not something we should be relying on. Okay, so this is from the year, the year before, so we can see it again. Same exact thing, all right? On-ball defender does a really nice job of taking away space, getting aggressive. We are in drop over again, keeping his chest in front of the ball. Our gap defender, if you remember from a couple clips ago, our gap defender did not do a great job, okay, of recognizing where his man was. And now, because he played super aggressive on ball and forced him, the ball handler, into a more of a penetration instead of a pull-up, now you're funneling him into your help. And now it becomes very difficult. What does this guy have? His only option is a kick out here. And at the high school level, players are going to make mistakes when you put pressure on them. So we do that. It ends up turning around and, and leading to two points on the other end of the floor. So that's a nutshell of how drop over works and some of the keys that are really, really, really important on how to defend it. So just a recap, aggressive on the ball, communicate, communicate, communicate early and often and don't care if the offense knows it and no paint. No paint, whether it's on the ball, and no paint off the ball. Make sure you do a nice job of taking away the paint. If you can do those three things and make players hit high-level contested jumpers from the perimeter, your odds of winning go up significantly. All right, so this is back to the same game. And uh, we were having issues with this specific player coming off of ball screens and getting in the lane. Uh, this is actually their best player that we mentioned in a clip before. So here comes the ball screen, and we want to go – under because you know what he's doing a really nice job of getting in the lane wasn't necessarily hitting threes but he was getting in the lane but the rules still apply we need to pick the pressure up we cannot allow the offense to dictate where they're setting this screen they want to set it here we want them to set it out here and at the end of the day we dictate where the screen is set based on our body placement so pressuring the ball is extremely important then because of that, he knows we're in under. He goes, Laz goes under here. But look what happens when you go under at the three-point line. Look how much space you're giving the other team's best player. It's way too open. That's a great look. Good players knock down shots. So we can't afford, we cannot afford to allow him to now get into a rhythm of getting the lane and knocking down shots early in a game. Because now you're giving the other team way too much confidence. We needed to do a better job of pressuring the ball and fighting under up here. So let's take a look at another one. So here's another pitfall of going under. So this is the same player. We're playing them at their place earlier in the season. And if you notice, we're going to be going into drop under once again. Here comes the ball screen to his left. Okay, we call left. He knows it's coming. He's searching for it. He knows it's left. He sees the screen happen. But look where our guard is picking the ball up. He's playing him at the three-point line. He's not pressuring this basketball. 
And on top of that, if you do get caught in a situation when you're at the three point line, because it's going to happen, once you see that screen's coming, you need to flip your hips and get up on him and chase him over that screen if that's the defense you want to be in. Or if you want to go under, you need to absorb space here so that screen has to be reset and give you more space to go under. But the sitting and waiting is going to cause more problems than not. And here's the biggest pitfall for going under if you don't do a good job getting under. Screener comes off, right? Screener starts to roll. And any screener in high school basketball is, gonna, is taught to roll and just continue to slide and take away the guy who's trying to go up to give his ball handler more and more and more space. Our center sees that we get pinned and he cannot allow for this guy to get a free look. This is their best player. So what's he do? He contests. It's a great contest. But what happens? Our, our point guard is now on their center in a one-on-one -on -one for a rebound. It is not something that's advantageous for us. And we cannot afford for a decent possession. We force him into a tough shot. We contested by a 6'6 kid to now give him an opportunity to get on the glass and, and get a second opportunity. So it's really important that we pressure up the floor, make sure we initiate where we want the screen to happen. Don't let it push us down. Here's another one now. So same player, Laz again. This is what happened in the first clip where he got stuck all the way at the elbow and guy hits a three at the top of the key. Now... Same player, same defender, same screener. Screen comes, but he picks up the pressure. Now look where this screen's taking place. Instead of being on the three-point line, now we're looking at NBA line, maybe even a couple feet off the NBA line. So now to fight under, look at the difference in that shot compared to the one we just saw two clips ago. Now you're taking a fully contested three-point shot off the dribble. Better result. Better result for the defense. So again, it's all it all boils down to your keys. What can you do to influence where the ball screen happens? And what can you do to make sure you're not giving the offense too many advantages? Because as it is in, in on, on defense, the offense has all the advantage. So you need to try and give yourself advantages. And one of those ways is going to be by pressuring the ball and forcing the offense to set screens further and further away from the three-point line. So here it is. They set the screen. Once again, he gets under and does a really good job of, of just continuing to fight. And, I mean, that is textbook closeout and contest. Spectacular job on that play. Here's another one. Same thing. Now look at now where we've picked up our pressure. Now we're picking up our pressure at the half-court line. We are not allowing the offensive player to dictate anymore. He's all the way up. Screen happens again. Roughly the same spot that we just saw in the last clip. We're in drop. Communication's happening. He's calling right, right, right. He now, the fender now knows, screen's coming. I got to now fight my way under this. He does, fights his way under, almost negates the screen altogether. The screen has no effect on him, and he's right in the play. So, so these are the kinds of things that we got to continue to do. Push the ball up the floor. Make him, make that screen come happen further out. Communicate, fight your way under, keep him in front of you, and now you're just limiting them, limiting them and their options and what they can do. Here's one more, once again. So this is Steven, again, our starting point guard, picking the ball up all the way out by volleyball line. Significantly better than what we were seeing in the first quarter. This is now in the second quarter, uh, and we have a lead. He's picking it up, very aggressive. Now look where this screen is happening. This screen's happening outside the volleyball line now. This player is not a threat from out here. M barely any high school kids are going to be a threat from out there. So he's able to fight around, get under, and defend it beautifully. Eliminate, eliminate the options that the offense has. And we do a really nice job on this possession too. Our center does a really nice job keeping his chest in front of the ball and not bailing and not trying to make a play on it, just doing his job, making him pick it up. And from there, uh, we get into a nice closeout and stop. So we talked about for the last 10 minutes, we've been talking about, okay, what do we do and how do we guard on drop over, drop under? How do we make... Our plays, what are, what are our keys? Well, now we're playing against the best team in our district at the time and arguably the best point guard in the district at the time. He is a spectacular shooter. Scouting report pretty much said he's a great player. We got to make sure we make it difficult for him. So screen happens, okay? We're in, we're in drop under because of how high this screen happened. Now, because he's a great player, we, 
we prefer not to go under, but they were they were very content with setting screens out here, and he can set it, he can hit it from this deep. So we have to fight over, but we're gonna go under because he's so far out and going under and that's amount of space, that's not good enough. That closeout is pretty similar to the one that we had two clips ago. And it doesn't matter. He's too good of a shooter. We can't give him that amount of space. So again, this is a couple of possessions later. Same thing. We try to go under. Probably got away with a little moving there, but we try to go under, but we didn't do a very good job of pressuring him. We let him kind of play with it. So what happens? Our center knows, well, listen, if we're going to go under and we get stuck, I got to step up. I got to step up so, because now he's going to hit a wide open shot. So what happens? Our guard over here sees roller. And the way we're taught is on screen dribbling away. If there's a roller open, the guy opposite, the guy opposite the ball. So the ball's coming to the left. The guy in that right corner needs to help because I can't have either one of these guys help because it's the natural pass for a three. And both of these guys were knockdown shooters. So he has to help down on the roll. Really poor communication on this possession. And I will say that it's mainly because of who has the ball. A very talented player. Both guys extremely worried about him making a run against us. So they are sitting on it. And what happens? Ball drops in and the actual best player on the team, okay, gets a wide open look out of it. And it's mainly because of a lack of fundamentals and lack of what we do. Just all the little things. We talk about pressuring the ball. Don't do that. We talk about keeping our chest in front of the ball and fighting under. We don't fight under. We don't communicate. Both guys stay on the ball. All of those breakdowns are going to lead to big mistakes uh, for your team, and they're going to end up costing you. So now let's talk about, okay, you know what? We're not doing a really good job of pressuring the ball. So this is now in the second half. And even pressuring the ball, kid was just getting right by us. He's very, very quick. So we're sit sitting back, but we're going to go over. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit back. Here comes your screen. And now the guy guarding the ball, you're going to fight over. We'll stay with your chest in front of it, but you're going to fight over. So he fights over, kind of stays tight to his body. The luck, Luckily for us, this kid was more of a mid-range. He didn't really get to the rim a lot. If he got in the paint, he was looking to create. So we knew if he was going to pick it up to shoot it, it was going to be somewhere in here. And that's why fighting over made the most sense. We get up, good contest, fall short. Next possession. Next possession, same exact look, same exact look. They go into that ball screen. We know it's coming. We're communicating it. We drop over. We fight another contest, and we're able to affect another play. So just because your game plan says, hey, you know what? We're going to have to pick this guy up at half court, and we're going to have to fight over. You know, it, it doesn't always work that way. you got to be able to in-game adjust. And that's why it's extremely important that you're not stuck in one way, that when you practice ball screen defense in, in practice specifically, you go over three or four different coverages because you're going to need them. You're absolutely going to need them. And, and, and this game exactly shows it. We played the same guy two different ways, and it gave us opportunities to defend them on both, on both different ways. The under wasn't working. The over was. Here's another situation. So now this is more of a dribble handoff. But whenever we see big to little dribble handoff, we treat it just like a ball screen because we're not going to switch our big onto it. And the guy with coming off the screen is still like the ball handler. So what do we do on dribble? What do we want to do against this specific player on ball screens? We want it to go over. So our big is in drop, takes away the rim. Our bigs and drop, not pressuring the ball handler. There's no reason for that on this dribble handoff. Our guard knows, fight over the top. Nothing easy getting to the rim. So little things like that are absolutely critical. If you're going to be able to stop great players, you have to be able to run different coverages at them to be able to slow them down. <clears throat> then we get into another one of their guards, and they went into it, – it's a pitch and screen. Uh, so he's setting a ball screen here. We're going to be in drop. We're in drop and we're fighting over. Again, this is just the, the call that we were in. We fight over. Great job. Forcing now into a tough pop and ends up being a turnover. So 
if you do a really nice job of communicating and doing following your principles and doing the little things right, you're going to be able to defend at a high level. So there you go, fight over. We're back into it. Pitching screen. We're in drop again, communicating. That screen's coming on your right. Fight over the top, stay attached. Nice pressure on the ball and force them into a tough pass and a turnover. So to recap how we cover, and especially when we go drop, our biggest key in any basketball game is we want to win the paint. We want to win the paint. We believe that if we can win the rebounding battle and the points in the paint battle, we end up winning those games more often than not. So when in our main focus when we're guarding ball screens is to ensure that we are not allowing for any penetration. We don't want that ball getting in the paint because what happens when the ball gets in the paint against your defense is it collapses. Some guy has to step over and help. And now you're scrambling and now you're losing your matchups and you're no longer able to dictate what the offense can do. They are dictating to you how you defend. And so we have to completely eliminate that by taking away paint touches. That's one of our big things. So now let's talk about dribble handoff. So down here, we don't see a whole lot of guard guard ball screens. Everything you've seen has been a big screening a guard. Um, we don't see a whole lot of guard guard down here. We see a lot more of guard dribble handoffs. Uh, every now and then you'll see guard guard and we just do basic switch. Uh, nothing too complicated. But in dribble handoff, we run, we call it open up. And the guy handling the ball. So this one's going to be actually not a specifically good open up. So we start off and we're in a drop over. We fight over to a good job, not letting the ball in the paint. Our help was great there. So the possession starts always big little. We were in drop over here, fight over. Good job taking away space. Our gap was good. Now they're going into dribble handoff. So they're going guard, guard, dribble handoff. So whenever we see dribble handoff, one of our biggest things is the guy guarding the ball has to recognize what's happening. And that's actually not a very easy skill. Kids sometimes don't realize that the guy dribbling is dribbling to a dribble handoff and they stay way too aggressive on the ball. When we see dribble handoff, we open up. We're going to give the ball handler space because you've committed to handing the ball off. That's one. Two, the guy when he's going into a dribble handoff is not a threat when he's dribbling to the side. So we can give space, let that dribble handoff occur because more often than not, you're not going to create turnovers on dribble handoffs uh, because you're pressuring the guy with the ball. Uh, so what we do is, we tell the other defender who's guarding the guy receiving the ball to shoot. So we open up and shoot the gap. Boom. So now he's supposed to go between the guy who was guarding the ball, the guy guarding the ball, which is here. This is Thomas guarding the ball. And Jordan has to go between four and Thomas. He has to shoot through that gap and meet it on the other side. Why? Well, because on a dribble handoff, the odds of the guy getting the ball, turning around and going back the other way, are so low because of because of his momentum, you can defend it. So he needs to get through. He does not recognize that dribble handoff is happening. He does a very poor job and crashes right in to the guy setting the screen. Guy hands it off and just bumps him. If he does a good job of shooting the gap, that never affects him, and he doesn't allow a paint touch. Now, what happens here is the guy makes a horrible decision in kicking it out, but he could have gone all the way in the lane. There was nothing stopping him on that possession. So... That's another, that's one clip where it doesn't look so good. So here you go. You're actually going to see a guard guard screen here, basic switch, just switch, switch responsibilities. That's fine. And then we go into dribble handoff. Like we talked about high school kids, especially it's tough to recognize what they're going into. So we got, we actually drill this. We drill how to recognize, Hey, this is dribble handoff. This is not, this is penetration. So uh, right here, Alejandro doesn't recognize that, ball this going into dribble handoff so he doesn't open up steven our point guard doesn't recognize that it's happening and doesn't go through so we kind of get stuck in the mess we get lucky so again we talk about we don't want to get lucky if this guy comes off aggressively that jumble of players is not going to get the job done it's not so now let's go to us playing against palmetto high school very 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 good high school team uh, a lot of great guards and, and how do they run it? So here you go. They go into what they run this pitch action. It runs just like a dribble handoff. They just go and actually hand it off. It's more of a pitch. See, they pitch it, but it works just like a handoff and our rules apply just like a handoff. So right here, Jordan's got to give some space and Brian is going to shoot the gap, meet him on the other side. 
Boom. There was no impediment. There was nothing stopping him from getting it. Okay. Now here we go. The guard, guard screen. What do we do? We're going to switch it. Now, I, this is one of our bigger guys, but he's a four. So we could switch. We switch one through four. So he could switch that no problem. Boom. Switch. Great defensive play. Understanding our principles. We've got gap defense on ball on that switch. He played under the switch. Spectacular play for us. We've got our deep help. And we've got him guarding their best player. So now they're going into another dribble handoff. Now, here's the problem with this dribble handoff. So again, you have to be able to be flux, flexible in, in what you see and how you play it. And it's something that doesn't happen overnight. It's a lot of drilling, a lot of practice, and it's a lot of reps. Just tons of shell drill and just constant doing it. Um, so what's going to happen here is they're actually going into dribble handoff, which we should be opening up. But Laz recognizes there's a whole lot of traffic for me to try and shoot this gap. So he communicates one of our big keys against ball screens. He communicates to Brian. Hey, here comes got to switch it. So what does Brian do? And he was opening up. He gave space. He said, I'll take it. And then we end up getting an absolute spectacular possession out of it where we get a stop. So again, one of the big keys is communication and understanding your fundamentals. So back to the original part of the clip where we get the, the initial dribble handoff. So he penetrates and goes into a pitch, shoot the gap, meet him on the other side, no impediment there at all. Then we get our good switch, communication early, got under the screen, spectacular job on the switch. Jordan played the gap, eliminated penetration. Now they went into a dribble handoff, too much traffic. So what does our guy got to do? You got to communicate. Boom, switch it again. And that just makes us absolutely very difficult to score on on a regular basis in the half court you're going to have to be very very methodical and run a lot of really good stuff and, and get us off balance uh, you're not going to get us with the basic pitch because our guys defend it at a high level uh, so that's all of our our defenses where we're not initiating more pressure on the ball handler so this is when we trap so this is from two years ago and when we trap there's a couple keys to trapping that are extremely important and it's actually when trapping is very, very, very important that all five guys are in the right spot. So because sometimes when you go and dribble handoff or if you're in drop over, if one guy on the weak side's out of position, you may not get beat by it. But in traps, if not everyone's not locked in and playing on a string uh, and it connected, you're going to have issues. You're going to have lapses. So, so what are the keys that we want to see against traps? We absolutely uh, if you're guarding the ball, there's three things you want to do. You want to send the ball into the screen. You will not get rejected. You cannot get rejected. So if you're guarding the ball and you know we're in trap, when you hear our trap call, you're sending that ball into the screen no matter what. Even if it says he's a righty, only goes right, and he's going to his right hand, if we're in the trap call, you send it into the screen. You cannot get rejected. You need to chase the ball over the screen. So once the screen does happen, you cannot sit there and wait and see what happens and dance around with the screener. You need to fight your way through that screen, fight around it, and get ready to lock in the final step, which is lock feet with your trapper. You know, get your feet, attach yourself, play big, and do not try to steal it. The worst thing that you can see in a trap is guys sticking their hands in. And one of our clips is here. It's actually a great clip. And then we make a mistake and we reach in. Now, that's the keys for the guy with the ball. The guy guarding the screener is just as, if not more important. So the first thing is you got to communicate. You got to call out the side. So if it's screen right or left, and you need to call out whatever coverage you want to call it. You want to call it fire, hot. You even want to say trap. Like we say, we don't care if the offense knows it's coming. So if whatever your call is, make sure you're communicating it early and often. One time is not enough. Two times is not enough. You know, as you can see, we get about six, 700 people at our games. One time calling our call is not enough. It's got to be like five, six, seven times calling it. That's your best chance. Then as the guy guarding the screener, you need to get parallel to the screen. So you need to make sure you get your shoulders are matching the shoulders of the guy you're guarding on the high side. That means if he's setting the screen facing the sideline and going and the basket's on his left, you need to be on his right. You need to have your, your shoulders on his right parallel to the screen. You're like creating a barrier for the ball handler. And then lastly, do not allow him to turn the corner. If the ball handler is able to come off that screen and turn the corner on you, trap is dead. 
Trap is dead. There's nothing we could do. And you're putting us on a four on three disadvantage automatically. Could be up to five on three, depending on how good the roller is. So absolutely need those three things. Communicate early and often. You need to stay attached to that screener on the high side and parallel and do not let them turn the corner. Off the ball, it's just as important because now we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage off the ball. When we trap, now it's four on three off the ball once the roll happens. So the guys off the ball, we have a couple positions you could be in. You could take the passes nearest the way, which we call obvious passes, right? And then the furthest guy from the ball is going to do what we call split two. So you're going to split the two furthest guys away from the ball. So let's take a look at a clip here uh, where we don't do a very good job of these things. So ball comes. They go into middle ball screen. Our big is late. Our guy guarding the ball doesn't either doesn't hear the call or doesn't do it right. In this situation, number two here should be flipping his hips and sending that ball into the screen, into his trap, because that's where his help is. He should not be allowing this ball to go back to the left. On top of the fact that our big is late, he's not parallel to the screen on the high side, and now we have nobody in position ready to help because we can't even set this trap. So he gets rejected. Now look what happens. Deadly sin. Now we've got two guys behind the ball doing absolutely nothing. And we're scrambling to try and recover. Okay. Can't have that. Picked up a blocking foul on that one. Next possession. Same thing. They call their set. Outside ball screen this time. Instead of sending a middle, they're sending him to the sideline. We're a little late. We're a little late. He's not where he needs to be. He's not attached to the screen. The guy guarding the screen does a good job. He does flip his hips, but he doesn't get on the ball. So remember, basketball and the way you defend builds on itself. Ball screen defense doesn't change. If we want to go over, we were talking about drop over, what do we got to do? We got to pressure the ball. We got to stay attached and fight over the screen. Well, we're not attached here. We're not putting pressure on this ball. We're letting him be too comfortable. And this guy, our center, is not where he needs to be. He should be up all the way over here parallel. He's not. He's late. So now what is he? He's flat. And the worst thing, the worst place for a big guy to be that has slow feet is to be flat. Because now you're going to give up the sideline. And what's that? That's an automatic foul call every single time, whether we get away with it or not. So right now, he turn, let's say we don't get the foul. He turns the corner. He's still getting in the lane. Still getting in the lane, getting a free shot, whether it goes in or not. Again, we judge based on did he get a great look because we didn't do our jobs? Yes, he did. That's two points in our mind. So, again, get pressure on that ball, fight him over the screen, get parallel, and then lock in the trap. So two not particularly great traps for us. Now let's take a look at one that we do much, much better. So screen comes. This is a little later. This is in the second quarter. And we recognize early on, hey, you know what? They're trapping. We're setting the ball screen. We're trapping. We know what's happening. So what does number two do? He goes to take away space. He's on his way to take away space. Our center is attached to the screen. There is barely any space between them. So he's able to be there earlier. And now what? Yeah, he might be flat, but the pressure on the ball doesn't allow this guy to be comfortable to be able to get him off balance. So now what? We lock in the trap. But what's the one thing we should never do in a trap? Leave it. The whole purpose of the trap is we want the guy with the ball to make a bad decision out of the trap. If when we trap it, we get out of it, we just bailed him out. All, all our center had to do was stay there. And all this kid had was one pass. Look at the other three guys. This one's running away from the play. This guy's backing up. He's not going to be able to make this ball here. And so if we do a better job of locking that trap in, we wouldn't have this easy pass. We would have had him forcing it somewhere else and causing a turnover. And we know that because of what we see in the next clip. So here we go. Another outside screen. This time he's going to run it to, toward the left side of the floor, toward us. I'm sorry, to the right side of the floor. We set the screen. We set the screen. Fight over the top. Played vertical. We're not trying to steal it in the trap. Turnover. When traps are engaged, we do a very nice job of forcing the ball to be a turnover. Here's another one. Screen on the outside. Again, this was this is a very tough one. These are one of those angles that it makes it very, very difficult. But if we know we're in trap and everyone's locked in, he's a little late, but it wasn't a set screen. It was just kind of happened. So what? Let's fight through it. 
We're fighting over. We're aggressive on the ball. Jordan's doing a spectacular job. Austin, our center, does a really nice job of not letting this ball get into the paint. Locked in the trap. We're here. And now what happens? So this is now that next level. We talk about, okay, rotate. Rotate and take away the obvious pass. When you look at this, there's only one pass that's obvious. It's this one. These three guys are standing and watching. We've got Anthony matched up on this guy, and two is splitting two. He leaves his feet. Deadly sin. Read, easy steal. That ends up being an end one on the other end of the floor. And then the last clip we're going to talk about, it's a high ball screen to the middle, okay? Well, our center is actually busting his butt, getting up there. He's communicating. He's telling them. We don't do a very good job of forcing into the screen, but 10 goes into it anyways. He's doing a really nice job of trying to get parallel. Even though he's late, not the fastest kid in the world. He tries. He's busting it. He's hustling. He's getting parallel. He's trying. We lock this trap in. And the worst thing that happens, and this is just, this is absolutely perfect position. You got a trap nice and high. Players far away from the play. Easy turnover waiting to happen. And, and we reach in. And we get a foul. We get a we get a jump ball call. That probably should have been a foul call. But overall, you could see what good timing and effort can do to a player. I mean, this guy was their best player in the clip we saw earlier, and I, he took two dribbles out of a trap, and he didn't want any part of it. He's picking it up. He's ripping his way out, and, and it gives us opportunities. You know, this team uh, with this ball screen, we we ended up winning 18 games trapping. And then the following year, we went into what you saw in the district semifinal, uh, into our drop coverages. And then in the final, we went into the overdrop and switching, and we ended up winning the district final. So having having multitude of defensive coverages at any given moment that you can go to in a game to give you guys the advantage is huge. And it starts in the offseason, and it starts drilling it every day because at the high school level especially, consistency is hard to come by. And the only way to do it is just every day drilling and drilling and drilling it. So I hope this helped. I hope you guys learned something and I hope you enjoyed your time here. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you guys on the next one.